what I'd like to do to start things off to give us a frame of reference is to compare uh, the characteristics of the American, the dominant American culture, the white middle class culture, which I'm a, I'm really a hillbilly, but uh, because I got an education, I'm a part of the white middle class and compare it to uh, the non uh, dominant culture in America. But since America's culture is very much like influenced by European culture, this is gonna allow us to see, compare the dominant European culture of white middle class Europeans to the, uh, the uh, non-dominant culture, the uh, people there in Europe from Africa, from the Arab countries from various countries and, and compare it with their culture so that we understand ourselves a little bit better and maybe understand from my point of view, how democratic education uh, may not uh, be uh, affiliated well with collectivist cultures. First of all, let's look at the social history of the two cultures. Uh, according to this uh, uh, chart, uh, the dominant European culture, American culture emphasizes individualism and emphasizes in independence, where the collectivist cultures emphasize interdependence, getting along collaborative efforts. Uh, the, the worldview is Western Anglo-Saxon, Northern European, and the uh, worldview of the non-dominant cultures is, is non-Western. Next slide. Uh, the main orientation, this is very important uh, for the dominant culture, according to this uh, uh, chart, is objects. With the uh, uh, cultural minorities, it's people. This is very important to understand uh, when I visit people with my friends with a lot of money and power, they show me all their trophies. They show me all their pictures. They show me all the stuff they got. When I different visit people, my friends and uh, black friends and brown friends, they're more interested in sitting down and talking and things like that. Relationships and people are more important. Uh, let's look here that the uh, dominant culture is egalitarian. Everyone seems to be equal, adults, children, everything. Uh, but in the non-dominant culture, there's it's hierarchical, a rec respect for tradition and authority. Uh, let's say over here, uh, we're going to the zoo because everybody wants to go over here in the non-dominant culture. We're going to the zoo today because that's what grandpa wants to do. Next slide. Uh, let's look at the child development. Uh, primarily, individual it's individual matter. According to Piaget, it happens in stages, and it's the same for everyone. Let's look at the non-dominant culture. Primarily, a social matter it takes different paths depending on the goals of a child rearing in that particular community. So this is a big difference between uh, the white middle class European culture that's associated with democratic education and those cultures with which they may want to engage. Next slide. Let's look how parents define uh, uh, cognition in the early development stages of the child. Knowledge of the world, being able to define and describe and, and linguistic communication skills. So uh, this is important to help us understand what that says. Let's look at the non-dominant culture. Development of social intelligence is more important interpersonal relationships and responsibility for others and cooperation are more important. I remember the story that uh, Four Arrows told at, at one of the Arrow Conference or IDEC conferences. He said you had, there was a native, there was a teacher and she had a class and she said, who's ever here the most gets a big chocolate bar, one of those big chocolate bars big Hershey bars. And it happened at the end of the semester that a, if you will, excuse my terminology, a, a, a white girl and a Native American girl were there every day. So they both got a big chocolate bar and the white girl said, I can't wait till I go up to my room, turn on the TV and scrunch down on this chocolate bar. The Native American child opened the bar and split it up and shared it with their class because it would be impolite for her to be so individualistic. Next slide, please. Concepts of intelligence. To the dominant culture, the white middle class culture, 
An intelligent child is one who's aggressive and competitive. For the other non-dominant culture, an intelligent child may be one who knows how to complete chores for the family. Now, this is a very big difference in how we view children, how the dominant culture, American culture, very big. Next slide. Uh, let's look how parents communicate. According to this chart, white middle class parents, which make up probably most of the democratic education people, uh, communicate distally. They see a child over in the playground. Billy, I told you not to play in that dirt. Now put it down. Here with the non-dominant culture, the parent will come here, Billy, sets Billy on her lap, put your arm around Billy. Now I told you not to touch that stuff over there. Now go back and stop playing with that dirt. More of a communicating through touching and holding. Next slide. Uh, here we have uh, how the school emphasis on the development of each child's potential. And we'll see that this is another very big difference between the free school, democratic school philosophy, uh, a Sudbury philosophy, if you will, and the philosophy, the, the values of the non-dominant culture. Schools here emphasize each child's development. Here, the family perceives this as encouraging undesirable selfish traits. We'll find out according to the non-dominant culture when we allow the child to choose what they want to do, when they want to do it, how they want to do it, where they want to do it. It's not necessarily bad or wrong. It's just the philosophy of the dominant culture. But this is perceived as trying is developing undesirable selfishness in students. And so they may re, be reluctant to want to be a, a part of democratic schools. Thank you. Next slide. Eight, uh, this is the last one, uh, the classroom learning styles. In the dominant white middle class culture, uh, students prefer to work alone and asking for help is a sign of weakness. Raising your hand, asking questions is a sign of weakness that you don't know, you don't know what's going on. Uh, however, that's a strength in, in the non-dominant culture. They prefer to work in groups and seek out classmates and, and actually ask for help. They want to be associated with, with each other because they're socially oriented. Next slide. So let's look at the definition of democratic education from the UDEC website. And we see here that in particular, uh, they want to give choices to the child regarding what to do, when to do it, where to do it, how to do it, and, and with whom they do it. And they want students to have a say so in how schools are run and the sanctions of the school. Next slide. Uh, here we see, uh, uh, go to the next slide, please. Here we see that, again, the foundations are the values, the culture of, of equality and shared responsibility. That's somewhat collectivist. And collective decision-making is somewhat collectivist. All members of the community, regardless of age or status, have an equal say over the decisions. That may not be collectivist because collectivists are more hierarchical oriented. And the self-directed learning, learners choose what they learn, when they learn, how they learn it, with whom they learn it. And that following the intrinsic motivation and pursuing the child's interests is basically what democratic education is about. So we have now a framework to understand what we'll be talking about next. Next slide. Next slide, please. So look, the question is, can democratic education be universalized? That's what we're gonna be talking about. Can it be universalized? Next slide. Let's look at two different perspectives. Next slide, please. The European perspective and, and the African perspective on, on, on people. The European perspective based on Descartes basically says that uh, the principle uh, since people think uh, we must be uh, uh, here, we must be a person, we must exist. I think therefore I am. Descartes' per first person perspective becomes the essence of the individualism of European thought and culture. Very important. 
thus learning according to this point of view, learning concerns self-discovery, self-development, self-fulfillment, self-reliance, and personal autonomy. So this uh, uh, Descartes philosophy is a basis according to this of the democratic education. Next slide. Let's look at the African perspective. <clears throat> I am because we are. I can't exist by myself. I only exist in relationship to other people. A human being only becomes a human being through other human beings. <clears throat> we have a proponent, Dick DeGroote, a South African, who's come up with the term communal constructivism. We exist because we are seen because the people around us respect us and acknowledge us as a person. Learning should always be, he says, in connection with community because nothing of what we learn is of value unless it is of significance and to the perseverance and well being of the community. And thus we need a pedagogy of recognition when we work with collectivist cultures. It's important that they be seen. Next slide. We even see in quantum mechanics that properties don't exist only in relationships. The electrons properties when it reacts with something else, when, when it, it doesn't have anything else around it, it has no position, no trajectory, no locality. A part only exists when we observe it. When we look away, it doesn't exist. Quantum physics denies a third person objective description of reality, which is very much a part of scientific uh, European scientific thought and objective point of view. And then we have, interestingly, Philomena, Philomena how do you say that? Philatimo, a Greek term for a sense of community, a sense of belonging, a sense of only being there and having an identity in regard to being involved in the community. Next slide. We also have to understand that collectivist cultures have a fear of democracy. They see democracy as two sheep, two wolves and a sheep deciding what to have for lunch. They see democracy as a, a form of colonialism, the colonialism that they experienced uh, as a colonial country. Cultural minorities as political minorities can't win in a majority rules decision-making system. So they distrust it. The families of collectivist cultures, minority cultures, uh, aren't that democratic. Like I said, we don't have a vote about what we want to have for dinner. The mother and grandpa and the elders decide that. And we might consider consensus rather than uh, majority rule democracy in decision making if we want to work with a variety of cultures. Next slide. We see the idea of freedom. Have, we have positive freedom, freedom to and negative freedom, freedom from. My black friends, they're not interested in freedom from. That's what the preschool and the Sudbury Valley School and the democratic school parents want freedom from government interference in what they're doing. So they're forming their own schools, but that's not a concern of minority, cultural minorities. My black friends want freedom too, freedom to vote, freedom to live where they want. They, they view the government as protecting their freedoms and not as an interference. So we have to distinguish these two kinds of freedoms when we work with other cultures. New slide. We have to understand that these cultures see individualism as a, as a weakness in a sense. The European dominant culture emphasizes the individual, <clears throat> the non-dominant cultures emphasize family and community. So as far as achievement goal, goals, this question is asked, is an achievement by a child in a school a sign of individual effort or success and success, or is it good news for the family? Next slide. We have the term bicultural. Now, some of you may live, I grew up in a bicultural family. My family was a hillbilly and the school's culture was the dominant culture. So I had a culture at home and a culture at school. So the issue is that when you work with families whose home culture is different than the school's culture, they may see going to school as an imposition of the dominant culture on their family culture. 
because the imposition, the implication is that the school's culture is superior to the family's culture, that the democratic school's culture is superior to their culture. And, and in traditional schools and public schools here, uh, schools, you have to trade in your home culture for entrance into the mainstream. And that some parents and students choose not to enter into the mainstream and thus reject education. Thank you. Uh, next slide. Uh, we have the free school movement. Now we're going to look at the traditional schools, which are teacher centered, the free school, democratic school movement, which is child centered. And then we'll look at a third option, the freedom school, which is community centered. Next slide. Let's look at reading to the black cultures here in, in the United States in general. Uh, letting child learn to read while they're ready is, is not something that they want. The black American community can't afford to let their children learn how to read when the child is ready. Like many cultural minorities and ethnicities, they can't be as free with their freedom as Europeans, who uh, regardless of their social economic class benefit directly or indirectly from their whiteness. If we want to work with reading with cultural minorities and ethnicities, Learning has to be a political act because going to school is a political act. And we'll see that it's not so much a political act for the dominant culture, it's more of an economic act. Uh, next slide. There is risk in exercising our freedom, intellectual freedom and creativity. No, we can't do that, says my black friends or people I know uh, from the cultural minorities. We're still black as a, as a minority, still at risk. We can't be as creative as whites. We can't fall back on the majority of ethno Eurocentric system as well as white children do if their time in a free school is unproductive. We must be conscious of being black all the time. And there's a risk involved in exercising our freedom and gambling. Next slide. So basically, you may have to realize, the democratic education people may have to realize that uh, uh, cultural minorities can't afford free schools. Parents know their kids are not free, white and 21, regardless they're still black in the US. We don't have the resources and power to protect ourselves if we fail. The consequences of failing are devastating. We can't afford free schools. White children are advantaged from the start and can well be more free or leisurely with learning and schooling thus taking more chances. They won't pay a higher price as the dominant, uh, as the minority cultures do, and they may never catch up. Next slide. So this is a challenge to the child-centered school, child-centered education. Challenges progressives, uh, uh, this, pro, uh, this talk is challenging progressives to take seriously that African-American educators see child-centered and holistic approaches as excuses for not teaching any skills, setting up these minorities for failure. Student control learning choices about what, where, and how, and with whom they learn have possible negative social political consequences for cultural minorities. Next slide. Let's look at play. Uh, toys, uh, 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 stimulate personal independence and are a are used for to mastery for technological masteries parents that want their child these are the white middle class european parents and i'm going to argue uh, a lot of the parents who are involved in uh, democratic schools right now they want their children to be verbally competent and are able to construct knowledge out of the physical world from observing and manipulating toys and of course we'll see that uh, in that culture, according to this, my research, uh, material objects are not shared in families. So we have a child playing, they're four years old, they're playing with blocks, they got the blocks all stacked up, and then they finally put a block on top of the stack of blocks and the blocks fall over. And the parents say, look, or the teacher says, look, Billy's learning the laws of gravity at four years old. Next slide. Playing toys in a non-dominant culture 
a toy would, <clears throat> a toy would be of little value outside of this role, <clears throat> this role in an interaction with another person. So toys are there to help people talk and interact. They're not to learn how to manipulate so that I learn how to manipulate objects. That's what the dominant culture sees toys there. The value of physical objects is primary that they mediate social interactions. To an extended family, uh, material objects are shared. So now we see a, a child from a non-dominant culture building these same blocks and putting the blocks, the big one on top and they fall over and, and the child's parents and the teacher said, and, and this attracts children. Uh, look, Billy's making friends. They see that as a way of making friends rather than learning about uh, uh, science. Next slide, please. Now we have the issue of democratic education and social justice. This is an email, personal conversation I had back in uh, 2009. The development of freedom of the individual student trumps the social justice activities up for the greater good because a lot of what we're talking about is what are the common good responsibilities of private alternative schools? Do they have social justice responsibilities? According to this, we see how Sadovsky uh, and the Sudbury Valley model has a deliberate stance on not having the school involved in social justice efforts. They believe that such projects are too often an imposition upon the student by an adult perspective, and so have no need for such goings on in that school. Again, this is seeing the two different points of view of the, uh, uh, the white middle class uh, European culture and the cultural minorities on uh, imposition on children because there's no imposition by adults on children in the uh, uh, democratic school model. Next slide, please. So we see here though, let's look at how uh, uh, some American blacks look at this point of view. Lisa Delpit in Other People's Children says, uh, the, the, liberal, the liberals view a display of power or authority as disempowering students. Liberals act under the assumption that to make any rules or expectations explicit is to act against liberal principles and thus limit the freedom and autonomy of students. This is an unnecessary overemphasis on individual justice, to according to Lisa. Do not also regard social justice actually skews what freedom is, she says, because they feel uncomfortable with power and free democratic schools orientations will not act powerfully and stress injustice to students. This deadens consciousness and conscience and thus indirectly any responsibility for social issues. So this can be something we can discuss later. Next slide. We see here, uh, Baldwin says, education is, is, is about power anyway. It's all about power. And uh, schools are political sites and, and free schools and democratic education schools can't deny that this is about power, even though they feel uncomfortable with power. And that schools are political sites and they may not think they're being political, but they are. Of course here, power corrupts, but so does powerlessness. And education is indoctrination for whites and subjugation for blacks. So we could apply this, that are democratic schools indoctrination for whites and subjugation for the cultural minorities they have to work with or want to work with? We'll answer, try to answer that question. Next slide. Let's look at freedom school. We had the traditional schools, which were teacher centered. We had the democratic and free schools, <coughs> which are child centered. Let's have a third choice, community centered education. Freedom schools started in the US in 64. Uh, they met and, and children taught, elders taught, they spent time together learning and they mainly uh, taught about self-confidence and voting and political skills and student rights and black history. Next slide. 
out of the free, freedom school movement came the black independent school movement, which is still around. There, there are black independent schools in, in America. This is a school that's closed now that was in New York City, the Uru Shasha, Sasha Shul. And inside this door, they had their K to six classrooms in school, but they also had a, 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 a food, a, a food pantry and they had a clothing closet and they had meeting rooms for the people who lived in the community. The school and the community were the same thing. And this is a good example of, of uh, cultural minority. Next slide. So we have to admit that schools are political sites. Uh, in fact, down here, we'll see that schools, regardless of what kind of school they are, are a child's introduction to politics, to life in the polis. That's very important to realize that. And, and uh, so I'm arguing if we wanna do, if democratic ed school people wanna do and work with a non-dominant culture, they have to teach students how to community organize, regardless if they don't or not. Schools are political sites and they do political acts. Next slide. We see here that black hair and clothing styles <coughs> are fashion statements, but they're also political statements. I know that some uh, that people know what sagging is. That's what the gentleman do here on the right is sagging his pants. This is a political statement. It's not. It is a fashion statement, and her hair is a political statement. Next slide. Uh, what I've done since schools are political sites is, uh, is develop a learner's bill of rights, which is given to students, not to adults. These are for students and they carry these learner's bill of rights around with them, which basically allows the school, the student to go up to an adult and show them their learner's bill of rights card and say, I'm a human being. I have an innate ability to learn. I was, <clears throat> I was born full of wonder, curiosity and motivated to learn. I view myself and I expect others to view me as capable of learning and showing what I know and can do. Next slide. This is a learner's bill of rights concept. It does have the word I at the beginning of each sentence. It is somewhat Eurocentric in that way. And it could be developed more of a collectivist orientation in the future. But for example, I have a right to think for myself, question authority and challenge facts. I have a right to need help and ask for it. I have, to, I have a right to evaluate my teachers and how they teach. Next slide. Uh, let's look at hip hop. Because I'm hip hop is a global movement and I'm sure that the democratic education people are involved with parents who are hip hop or will be involved with cultural minorities they deal with who are hip hop, because <clears throat> it's a worldview of those born after 1965. And it's about uh, being authentic, keeping it real, and keeping it right about social justice. We have to understand that hip hop models for youth the authenticity they seek. And it's basically about this most important statement right here. This is not a message to the oppressor, not in hope that they will listen, but with the expectation that my own existence will be clarified. We have to understand that this conference, this event, the democratic education movement itself is a, is a way of clarifying who we are as, as a society, as social groups, and as individuals. It's all about clarification. Another interesting point that keeping it real and self-actualization share the same DNA because self-actualization is about being authentic. Keeping it real is about being authentic. And finally, global hip hop culture is shared by members of both the majority and minority European cultures and communities. So we have to see hip hop as a way, not only of, of reaching and engaging cultural minorities, but looking at ourselves. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, here is Bushido, a German Turkish rapper, very popular in Germany. 
he's uh, also school king, an Algerian rapper who lives in Paris, very popular uh, with, uh, he has a song Liberté, which is the anthem of the Algerian freedom movement. So here we have two examples of hip hop influencing culture and influencing the politics of the countries, European countries. And you have to be aware of this. We have to, next slide. What are democratic schools for? Is the question. I've looked at a lot of democratic schools and one of their goals is happiness, well-being, and the individual fulfillment of children. Trust is important for our school, trust in our children that they will go their way and make use of the educational options offered according to their individual rhythm. It's a very individualistically oriented. Uh, this is supposed to be. <clears throat> European, current European families from cultural and ethnic minorities see school and going to Europe and will see democratic education is about survival. <clears throat> Schools to them have an existential purpose. Up here it's about being happy, down here it's about staying alive. These are two different orientations that democratic school leaders have to realize that they if they work with cultural minorities and, and, and ethnicities, that their schools, that it's about survival for them, not about being happy. Next. <clears throat> what I suggest is that the, dem that the democratic education, <clears throat> that we decolonize the democratic education movement. And this is done by <clears throat> first decolonizing your mind, second, looking at your past colonial relationships uh, where, educate, where Western education was used to subjugate and indoctrinate, realize that immigrants want to assimilate, but not at the expense of their home culture, uh, promote community-centered education, uh, use a culturally sustainable pedagogy that they use here in the United States where the democratic school would not only emphasize the culture that this student brings to school and its history, but also the dominant culture. You don't wanna have education about the dominant culture at the expense of the home culture, that you have to give that up, subtract it, leave it at home. <clears throat> no, bring it to school, we're gonna talk about it, and we're gonna talk about the dominant culture, this cultural capital, this social capital. We have to help uh, families of non-dominant culture realize that through a democratic school, they'll have more say so in what goes on than they do in the public schools. And finally, you can read my paper, Education for Liberation, Education as the Practice of Freedom, which has over 500 reads from 47 different countries on my uh, ResearchGate page. Next slide. What European democratic education can learn from non-dominant collective culture? Very important. Now we're starting to look at some important issues here. For example, the US ideal of self-fulfilled individual can, at the extreme, lead to widespread isolation, alienation, and violence. Hence, an emphasis on family responsibility and solidarity, so intrinsic to collectivist cultures, can impart a moderating influence on our society. Next slide. What can European democratic education provide culture minorities? One of the biggest things is that if they go to traditional public schools in America and in Europe, uh, the children who can't sit still and be quiet and listen, who have what they call a setting disability, may have to take a drug. And I think democratic schools and free schools offer an alternative to that, a non, uh, so the child can go to school get up, run around, be restless, and not have to take a, a drug. Uh, finally, both the dominant culture of the uh, democratic schools and the culture of the, uh, the uh, minority culture have a passion for education for liberation. We just have two different ideas about what liberation means, but both have a a passion for freedom. So can 
democratic education be universalized? If the answer is no, then, then what do we do? I think democratic education cannot be universalized. And I think I've explained that. However, if you think it can be universalized, do we develop a theory of democratic schools? Next slide. Uh, thank you. I'm ready for any questions. John, thank you. Um, I have a question. All right. Uh, can you go back one slide, maybe? The last slide. Can democratic education be universalized? What was your answer? It can't or no, it can? No, it can't be. It cannot be as it stands. It's just too, it's too individualistic. Is too concerned about the individual child. It has okay. no sense. It's not, look, let me say it one more time. It's not in our white people's DNA to not be individualistic. We don't have, look, we don't have a community. Black folks have a community. A black American can go to LA and San Francisco, and if they see a black person, they can say, hey, what's up, cuz? I can't go and walk down the street and go to a white person and say, hey, what's up, cuz? They'll look at me like I'm crazy. Because see, we white people don't have a community. We think we do. We have a small community. We have friends. But we don't have the community that cultural minorities have. They have a real community that they look out for and that they uh, uh, their individuality is reduced because they are a member of that community. That's why I think it's in our DNA of white people uh, not to uh, have uh, not to be able to, we have a sense of individualism. What are you, what are you think what we should do then if we can't uni universalize democratic education? Would you stop do, uh, un uh, would you um, propose to stop do democratic education or would you propose that um, these cultures do their school separately without interacting? What, what is your pr proposition? I gave several ways, although I'm speaking out of both sides of my mouth, I did give several ways that democratic education leaders can approach uh, 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 cultural minorities. Uh, one was the, the, the uh, drug issue over uh, restlessness and students running around. I said, you both uh, get into hip hop, uh, help realize that these uh, cultures want freedom and you want freedom. They're both very politically oriented. They are oriented towards survival. Uh, uh, they're down at Maslow's hierarchy at the bottom. You're kind of more up where you can worry about being happy and stuff. Uh, start there with that conversation because they have things to gain by joining your movement. You just got to see the connections. You got to decolonize your mind. You got to start saying, fuck, excuse my language. We colonized these people a long time ago and treated them terribly. We have to admit that that's going on globally with the Black Lives Matter movement in America. Uh, start to decolonize your mind. Read my paper on what an education for liberation is, and you'll see all that is, and that you share, uh, make your schools more community minded, get into social justice activities. I would critique the Sudbury model that uh, uh, these are many things that I put in there that you can reach out. That doesn't mean that they'll take your hand, but I think these are ways that you can reach out and as well, things you should do anyway, regardless of cultural minorities. I'm hopeful, but right now, uh, you know, I, I, you'd have to change yourself too much, which I think you can do uh, by decolonizing your mind. But am I making any sense, Henny? Uh, yes, um, uh, you're making sense. Hey, John, uh, I'm just looking back at one of the slides on democracy and the definition being like, uh, you know, in a critical way, democracy is two wolves and a sheep deciding what to have for lunch. Um, 
And at the end of that slide, it was consider consensus. And I wonder if you've watched the documentary that I think was presented yesterday about the circle, school circles um, and no, I didn't. waiting for consensus. It's, uh, it's very oh. powerful, it's very nice. Um, and it's a simple way to introduce consensus into a dem democratic school structure where you don't, you don't just leave it to majority rules. Um, well, uh, my come point back, was, come back. Yeah, can you hear me, Jet? Yes. My point was that the cultural minorities who are there as immigrants or who are born there, who 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 are, who who've been there earlier and were born in France or England or or uh, places, uh, democracy was a way of controlling them. It was a form of colonialism, and it was. Hey, you can vote for this. Yeah, if I vote, uh, I only got two votes and you got 20. Yeah, I can vote, but I'll never win. This democracy crap is another way of controlling us and making us happy about it. I think consensus is a more, a better way to attract uh, a diverse uh, uh, student population and families for a democratic school. All right, Martin yeah. has raised his hand, and then Christiana, and then Gary. Uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you. I think your argument is fatally undermined by the fact that you operate with cliches and stereotypes. It's You are making it all sound black and white, individualistic uh, versus collectivistic. Well, sure enough, you know, there are cultures that are more individualistic and those uh, that are more collectivistic and there is a tension between those two um, poles. It's never either or. And, you know, occasionally your, your argument really descends into farce. I mean, you say, I quote, that it's not in one white man's DNA to be, to be collectivistic. I mean, understood literally, that's actually a racist argument. I hope you don't mean it literally. Um, and when you talk about democratic schools, I think you, you often create a straw man argument. I mean, I, I don't recognize your criticisms in the schools I've heard about, read about, or, or, or became familiar with. Um, I mean, democratic schools of Sudbury type, which, which I know of, are very closely knit communities. And they are democratic, uh, not just by majority voting. Democracy is much more than a majority voting. And many of them actually adopt various ways of uh, consensus reaching, which, uh, which you are adopting. It's already there. So I think, first of all, uh, yeah, your, your argument is undermined by its black whiteness. And secondly, things you advocate for uh, in democratic schools is already there. Uh, so minority cultures have very little to fear from, uh, from democratic schools, which besides, they don't have to opt into if they feel uncomfortable about it. Over. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Marcin. Uh, if they're already there, then they're not shut up. Uh, I contrast and use stereotypes and generalities to make a point. The, the chart on the dominant culture, non-dominant culture was not my chart. It was a chart that, so uh, I speak in generalities and, and stereotypes on purpose to form clarity. Uh, I'm trying to get an argument. So again, if, if, uh, if this is already going on, then I'll shut up because I think that's the goal is to uh, have a democratic schools uh, attracted, uh, attractive to a, a variety of families. Thank you, uh, Christiana. Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for the speech. I I I agree with you in many aspects. I was living in Mexico for a few years. I received my PhD in Mexico in educational research and in uh, social interaction. And I definitely understand what you're saying about community. 
when I came back to Europe, it was crystal clear to me that we don't have communities. We don't even know what community means. In, in Mexico, people wouldn't say that I live here, I come from there. They say, I belong in this community. We don't identify ourselves that way. No. But uh, no, no, we don't. We definitely we don't even understand the meaning no, of it. Don't. Because no. it, it's not our reality for centuries. Exactly. Ne nevertheless, I want to say that democracy, it is not a value of itself. The values are equality, justice, freedom, peace. These are the things that we are trying to achieve with democratic education. Democracy, it's not perceived as uh, the, the main thing. It's just the vehicle. It's just the way that we, the path that we know how to walk. The values are, as I said, justice, peace. If someone else has a different path that can walk in order to get there, it is okay. And I think that it is also um, under the same umbrella as democratic education. Let me just say, for example, the community schools in Chiapas, in, in Mexico, or in many, many other Latin American places, we have these community schools who do operate in a very democratic way. We have the assembly of the community. Everybody has a word to say, even young children of the age of five can participate in the assembly. Actually, there is no age limit. So as, as from the moment they can articulate their desire and their thoughts, they can participate in the assembly. So I say that we don't really have to narrow down to democracy. We have to expand our view to the values that we want to construct. Democracy is the realization of the values. Christina may ask a if, if we don't, uh, just let me uh, close with uh, this okay. phrase, that if we don't see democracy that way, we can be very bureaucratic, technical people talking about democracy. Thank you. Uh, what is the social class of, uh, do you have any poor people, children of poor people in your schools? Oh, of course we do have poor people in Europe. Yes, of course. Okay. But also we, we have many well, immigrants. Uh, we have also minorities, <coughs> ethnic, ethnic <coughs> minorities, different ethnicities. But we, we, again, we don't have this sense of community. We don't have community living. Thank you. Derry, I think it's your turn. Okay. Uh, thanks for that, John. Um, so You're much welcome. in there that I agree with you resonates with my own experience, but of course you didn't talk about social class and poverty. But my, my own experience of coming from a, a poor, relatively in our culture, background, having a middle class education that created all sorts of conflicts and problems. And I guess one of the reasons I'm sitting here is still because of them. I'm trying to resolve them through looking for some way of bringing the qualities of the democratic school movement and making it available right across social class, uh, color, um, disadvantage, etc., etc., and looking to the future. I was really interested in the positive example of hip hop that you referred to, of actually giving a place to unite. When I was vice principal of a school, in an area of tremendous social deprivation, but also with a significant dominant middle class culture as well. Getting to what Christiana has just been talking about, which was the whole point of trying to create a democratic community school in right. an area which had the advantage of containing 
people from all kinds of backgrounds was exactly to produce equality, justice and freedom, the things that she talked about. Otherwise, democracy can just become the tool of the articulate middle class. And exactly. it was always a dilemma for me. How do you help all the kids seriously participate and benefit from the way in which you're trying to run the school as a democratic community? And I came to the conclusion that you had to have a certain amount of conscientization going on to help uh -huh. the kids from poor backgrounds who were struggling to learn to read had come to secondary school unable to read, for example, you had to provide a conscientizing experience for them. At the same time, another kind of conscientizing experience for the affluent middle class kids to realize just how privileged they were. Exactly. And it was possible to, with these two approaches, if you like, to create a common, unified, collective learning community hub out of the school. And it seems to me that's the way we've got to go in the future if we're going to have a survival future at all. So what do you see as the growth points? I completely agree with you that in some democratic schools, they're full of rather affluent, privately educated kids um, who don't have a very good understanding of the social challenges that so many kids are facing. So what's your solution for the future? How do we bring the best of the democratic education community into a conscientizing process for everybody? Well, that question right there, uh, there'll be answers to it, but see, Derry, that question right there is giving me chills because this is the question that we, I think there's some people in the democratic education movement uh, don't know what the question is, but you give them the question. So this is wonderful that you've given them the question. I'm argued there, uh, hip hop was one way, because it crosses uh, generations, it crosses uh, cultures, it crosses nationalities, and hip hop is about keeping it real, which is being authentic, which is what democratic education is about, being who you are, not being a phony, being authentic, finding yourself, uh, and it's all about keeping it right, social justice, being fair, uh, democratic education, realize that freedom may be seen differently from uh, uh, different points of view, also that issue, I think, of, of making children have to take drugs because they can't sit still, but democratic schools offer an option to that, that parents, if they have that option, they don't have that right now in America. If they had that option, they say, I'm taking my, I don't want my child to take drugs. I'm sending them to the democratic school. And I think education for liberation is important to everybody. And that is a, if you look at my paper, you're gonna see that this education for liberation, education as a practice of freedom is, is one way to attract everybody. And, and the conscientization of, of Friday that you're proposing is going to be useful in, in uh, opening the minds and decolonizing the minds of the majority culture. And it's also going to be able to help the, the uh, people of the working class. So Jerry, I think you framed our thesis right there. Thank you. Our thesis question. Thank you. Now, Mark has uh, raised his hand, please. Is it my turn? Hey, Mike. Yeah. Hi. Hi, John. How you doing, man? Yeah. Yes, You're fine you. to see you again. I You've got great hair, man. So do I. Yeah. Yeah. yeah same with you. <laughs> you too, John. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Same with, yeah. with him. Yeah. Um, your talk was very interesting and I have a question. What came up to my mind was what I read about the theory of self-determination. I don't know if you have uh, get in contact with the theory, which is, has a meanwhile a long tradition of more than 20 years, I guess. What's it called, please? Theory of self-determination. Of course, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. And they, uh, what I learned from them I'm not a very specialized person in this, but what I learned is that they identified by research that there are three basic personal psychological needs. If they are not fulfilled, these needs, the person gets into trouble and is less motivated and has a, a less, less 
wonderful life. And these three arguments or these uh, uh, psychological needs are called mastery, uh, uh, mastery, purpose or relatedness, and third is autonomy. And I think these three uh, special psychological needs have to be fulfilled somehow by the institution or the environment. And what I see in the democratic schools, they put a lot of uh, emphasis onto the autonomy part of it. Children can learn a lot, so they get close to the mastery aspect of the three needs, and they have a big amount of autonomy. So they are individually able to decide independently of other students and parents and, and adults. And this is working quite okay, but you are right. They sometimes lack the connection to the relatedness or the social purpose outside of, of them, their own personal interests, but the community-based orientation. And, yeah. uh, and so far I agree what, with what you said, but now uh, comes my point. In the community-based uh, uh, societies or, or areas where you uh, were talking about in Africa or I don't know, in some places, uh, they may suffer from not being able to get the necessary amount of autonomy. So they are much better equipped with the ability to get the relatedness and maybe the, the mastery as well, but there is a reduced amount of, of uh, access to autonomy. I imagine families, uh, Turkish families in Berlin maybe, or others where the father or the, I don't know, the older people dominate the children and keep them without the, uh, appropriate amount of autonomy. And so I see well, what I learned from you is not just to reduce the individualization of uh, democratic schools, but improve the, the relatedness aspect and in vice versa, these community oriented families or societies should put some more energy into the autonomy aspect of it. So that I'm done. Thank you for uh, letting me speak about that. Uh, yeah, autonomy, uh, of course, is important because even though we're a member of a group or an individual, we, we, we're not all hooked together in, uh, 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 by our skin. We're not some, we're not hooked together. We're individuals in a group. And so uh, you have the, right now, you have the, uh, the dynamics of cultures coming in, uh, or being in Germany that are collectivist and the uh, history of the individualism in, in Europe. Uh, I see the answer to that is answer the question. I am for autonomy, but for what purpose? Autonomy for the greater good? Yes. I don't think even collectivist cultures can go against that. Autonomy for the child's health because they're an individual when they leave home, when they get in society, autonomy for uh, psychological health uh, and Maslow's needs down there because autonomy and a sense of, uh, of uh, confidence, self-confidence, that you can make a difference, that you are a factor uh, is all ways of understanding that. We co can't throw out the baby with the bathwater in this sense. Uh, and especially when these immigrants come to places like Germany and it stands out that the adults uh, are are limiting the autonomy, the self-determination, if you will, of the individual students. I think that what the answer to that dilemma is to have autonomy, but for what purpose? Uh, autonomy can't be that, uh, that the child uh, 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 sees their home culture as, uh, as a definite deficit, uh, that they, uh, there's so many contradictions here that make you answer that, ask that question. 
And I think it has to be worked out with the answer to the question, autonomy for what purpose? Uh, and I think if it's for the greater good of the community and greater good of the child, then we have to have autonomy. We can't throw it out because it's a it's an existential reality. It's a political reality. It's a social reality. There's autonomy that you're speaking and we have to respect it and uh, deal with it. We cannot deal with it because you're implying that the, the collectivist cultures don't want to deal with it. They don't see it as a value, uh, but it is a value because we're all individuals. I hope I'm making sense, but I think you got a good question there. And if you work on it, uh, you're going to come up with a satisfactory answer. John, Hello? thank you for the presentation. Yeah, I learned a lot and uh, hopefully, uh, I love democratic education, of course. And I, I think it moves, if it also includes uh, uh, student-centered with community-centered learning, that it's gonna be able to uh, uh, bridge the gap between the cultures that it has to deal with. Uh, but I think first is uh, decolonize your mind and uh how do i do uh, it <laughs> and let's keep talking uh, uh if you can make sure that my papers on the common good responsibilities of private alternatives and can i know it <laughs> can be universalized uh, people can read them and they have my contact information and uh, uh let, let's keep talking yes we get we get back to you all right my man Thank you, thank you all so very much. If if um, nothing very urgent is still unsaid, we should close this meeting so that our students can go on for the next discussion panel. All right, Mauro, you stay care. Be careful. Stay, stay safe. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. <laughs>